Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Are we doing good? Are we, are we thankful this morning? Are we thankful to, to wake up, to have another day to praise the Lord? Amen. Are we ready to worship this morning? Are we ready to give God praise for all he has done and all he will, will continue to do? Because how many know that God is good? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, if you're ready, let's stand. God, we thank you for this day. Lord, as we worship you today, would your spirit fill this place? Lord, help us to encounter you and be willing to know what you would have for our lives today. And we just thank you for everything you do, Lord. We, we lift up the mighty name of Jesus in this place. In your mighty name, amen. Amen. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. And I'm so glad you're in my life. And I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My dead to pay from the cross to the grave. Praise the Lord. Isn't that the reason why we're here to lift up the name on high? Well, we're so glad you're here. Look at someone and say, I'm so glad you're here. We're so glad for those watching online. We pray today's a blessing to you. Today, we start a new series on the life of David. And so when we look at the life of someone in the Bible, we can remind ourselves of two things. One, God used them in an amazing way. And God wants to use you in the same way he used others or flow through others. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking right about you right now. <laughs> let's take a moment and let's open our hearts to praise him. You ready to praise him? Come on. You ready to praise him? You ready to lift up the praise and give honor to the King of Kings? Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for today. Another day you have given us. We will give you praise. We'll give you honor. We will be with those in need. Will you be with those who are crying out? Will you answer them and help them? And Father, will you help us to be people who honor you in every way? We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people with a loud voice said, Amen. Amen. Thanks. 
This morning, let's say who can stop? For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Because we know that our Lord, that nobody can stop the Lord Almighty in this place, Jesus. Lord, you rule over all. You reign over all, Jesus. So we are thankful, Lord, that we serve a mighty King, that we serve a mighty God, the God of the, the creator of the universe, the one who says, peace be still, the one who has created light, Lord, the one who gives us the strength, Lord, to keep going through every day, Jesus. Lord, we want to thank you, Father, Lord, that you are an unfailing God. We want to thank you, Lord, that no matter how crazy the world gets or how crazy the, the things seem around us, Lord, that you, Lord, you are the one that we can turn to, Lord. You are the one that gives us the strength, Lord. You are the one who makes a way when there seems to be no way, Jesus. So we praise you, Lord, because you are great and mighty, Lord. You are the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega, Lord. Jehovah Jireh, Lord, there you are more than enough, Jesus. More than enough, Lord. Oh, we praise you, Lord, because you are worthy of our praise. We praise you, Lord. We give you all the glory and honor. Oh, Jesus. And worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name, worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise, worthy is your name. 
was my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for now my life is yours and I will see of your goodness forevermore worthy is your name shame is gone I stand amazed in your love undeniable your grace goes on and on and I will sing of your goodness forevermore worthy is your name Jesus you deserve As your glory fills this place, you alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens. As your glory fills this place, you alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens. As your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exhausted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. You 
deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Be exalted. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Worthy is your name. Bless your name, bless your name, bless your name, hallelujah, hallelujah, just a lyric, just our voices. Worthy is your name, Jesus, you deserve the praise, worthy is your name, worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Come on, let's just sing. Let's just sing it to them. Let's just lift up your voice. Lift up your voice and give them praise and give them honor. There's none like He. He's your God. He's your Lord. He deserves all praise. He deserves all the glory. He has done so much. He has done so much. Just give Him thanks. Just give Him thanks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One more time. One more time. Nice and loud to the Lord. Is your name.
his name church bless his name for he is your God he is your fortress he is your God he is your fortress hallelujah blessed be his name blessed be his name God has done so much so much so much and he longs to hear the hearts of his people as we pray as we give him glory as we just recognize how good how great how wonderful he is because he is who he said he is he'll do what he said he will do he is mighty he is your god he is your fortress in him you can trust when you recognize who he is it changes the living tabernacle when you recognize in whom the god in which we trust he causes you to walk at a different pace talk in a different way because he is a mighty god and he's on your side give him some praise in the house of the lord hallelujah hallelujah bless his name bless his name hallelujah Let's make a way, because God makes a way. Hallelujah. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, you're working in Sing us out. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. in every heart I worship you I worship you you are here you're healing every heart we believe it I worship you I worship you you are here you are here you're turning lives up 
don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. You are way maker, miracle worker. seems to be a way is that not true can you give him a wave offering in the Lord can you let's sing it again let's sing it again hallelujah come and join me we make a miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my God that is who you are come on we believe in church we make a miracle worker promise keeper Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. your name even when even when whisper a whisper sing it in a whisper even when even when even when even when I don't see it you work oh God you when I don't feel it you work yes you never stop you never stop working mm. you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. Never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Hallelujah. Come on, give God some praise. Give God some praise. Blessed be his name. Blessed be his name. Hallelujah. How many times when you don't really see what God's doing and then God comes on the throne? How many can raise your hand and says, I've been there? 
How many times you don't have what you need and yet God comes just when you need it? How many know you've seen that? Because your God is always working for you. Give God one more time some praise in the house of the Lord. Lift it high. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be his name. Good morning. Just look at someone and show them your pearlies. Just show them. Go ahead. If there's some of them fall out, put them back in. Okay, just go ahead. Show them your pearlies. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. And smile. Smile. Come on. Look at somebody and smile. They, they, that's good. We're going to take a journey today, and I'm looking forward to the journey. The series on David, a man after God's own heart. Today we're going to talk about God sees your heart. Do you know that if you were to go to the doctor, there's 10 different tests that he may describe for your heart. I'm just going to let you know. He could, he could give you an echocardiogram, electrocardiogram, a magnetic renaissance image, an MRI. He may give you a CT scan. He may give you an exercise ca- cardiac stress test. You know, you've been on some of those stress tests, right? And here's the one you do know about. The pharmacological uh, stress test, that's where they use med- uh, medicine. Um, that's the one that's, you know, you don't have to even get on the treadmill, you know, you just, and then they put it in there and put the dye. Uh, they do a tilt test, you know, for people who sometimes are fainting and getting a little bit off, you know, uh, their, their equilibrium is off. Um, they sometimes will give you this uh, monitor that you wear everywhere you go so it can kind of see what's going on with your heart. And then, of course, if your arteries get clogged, they might do a uh, angiogram on you to kind of clean up the artery, maybe put a stent. These are all things that we do to the heart, depending on your condition, it will depend on your test. Your heart, though, is just the, what they call the chidea. The chidea is a, is a heart that pumps blood. That's the only thing your heart does. It pumps blood. But when the Bible talks about the heart, it's really talking about the soul, the being, the character, the holistic of who you are. Not just this thing called the blood. Really, the soul is really your mind. It's in here. It's, it's part of your soul, your intellect, your emotions, you know, your will. That makes up your soul. Now, if we look at the life of David... And most of you know your Bible a little bit. Some of you do not. I want you to know that we're going to look at his whole life. The good, the bad, and the ugly. But I want you to know, look at your neighbor and say, there's no, there's no ugly in your life. You see, this is the thing we have to learn from. We can learn from people's hardships. So we're going to look at this boy, this man, this king. We're going to look at his calling, his troubles, his trials, his strength, his weaknesses. We're going to look at his victories and his triumphs. And we can't delete any of those because that's the whole thing. Just like in your life. You have victories. You have triumphs. You have defeats. You have downs. You have up. You have weaknesses. You have strength. And sometimes, I don't know, but the human race will look at our strength and we don't want anybody to know that. Oh, I don't want anybody to know this. Do you know, do you know, is that sometimes that's what makes your character stronger is when you fight on those areas that God's trying to talk to you. David is not perfect. I'm going to mention that a couple times today. And I want you right now, let your neighbor know they're not perfect too. Good. Just let them know. You're not perfect. You may tell them they're close, but they're not perfect. So as we talk about David, I want you to understand he's not a perfect man. There's no perfect man and there's no perfect woman. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I want you to understand that. This is really important. But there's one thing in Scripture that we get to hear from God, God's testimony, that God says, David was a man after my own heart. I want you to get that. This series is to challenge you and me to go through a journey to learn the lessons he learned and what he did, how did he become a man after God's own, his own, God's own heart? And can we become children of God? Can we become a person that God would say, now there is a child after my own heart. There is one of my servants after my own heart. Wouldn't that be the greatest compliment you could ever get? 
Someone may come up to you and say, that's a really nice dress, a really nice hairdo. Hey, you look really good in those shoes. Hey, I really like this. But when God says it, whoa, could you imagine if God said that about you? Wouldn't that make you day? Wouldn't that make your liver quiver? Wouldn't that put a little step in your walk? It sure would. David never really heard those words. But I guarantee you that everybody else that reads those words recognizes David was a special individual. And we'll, go, we'll talk about reasons why as we take the journey. But in Scripture, we can learn some other things about some other characters. How about Enoch? What do we learn about Enoch? Well, the Bible says in Genesis 5, 24, Enoch walked faithfully with God and he was no more because God took him. I love this story. So precious. The story goes like this. One day, Enoch and God were taking walks. They took daily walks together everywhere. God was with Enoch and Enoch was with God. And they talked and they always take these long walks. And one day, one day, after taking these locks, they started to get longer and longer and longer until, until one day, God just looked over Enoch and says, I'm closer to my house than I am to yours. You want to keep walking? And Enoch said, sure. And then Enoch was no more. He was faithful. But if you look at the story of Enoch, it was after he had a child, something took place with Enoch that changed him. And the Bible says he was a man who was was faithful. He walked faithfully before his God. Abraham, the Bible tells us that Abraham was a friend of God. Can you get that? But you shouldn't be too surprised, a friend of God. What does Jesus say in John chapter 15? You are my friends if you do what I command. Wait a minute. Did you get that? God calls you his friend. Jesus calls you his friend if you do his commandments. Someone say, pray the Lord. So Abraham walked with God. He Abraham walked with God, but he was also a friend of God. Moses, Exodus 33, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. You know, when the burning bush was taking place, God was just speaking like I'm speaking to you. It's amazing, isn't it? These are stories of intimacy with God as they walked life out. How about the Apostle Paul? Apostle Paul has his counter with God, and then he goes, God goes to Ananias and says, Ananias, I want you to go to this um, man named Paul. And this is what he said about him. This man is a chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and before the people of Israel. Someone say chosen instrument. Come on. Now I want you to look at someone and say, you're a chosen instrument. Come on. I want you to understand something. God is looking to use each one of you for a certain task. And Paul the Apostle was a chosen instrument to do a work of God. We'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Very important. I want you to understand that as we take this journey, I want you to put yourself there sometimes. What would you do if you were in David's position? What would you do if you were in David's circumstance? Because you have to realize that you're going to be faced with fear. What are you going to do with fear? You're going to be faced with troubles. What are you going to do with troubles? You're going to be faced with times of tribulations. How are you going to respond to those moments that you were in? So as we look at this, I want you to understand that over 3,000 years ago, God chose a young man and his name was David and he was to be the king of Israel. And out of eight sons... God's favor fell on this little boy named David, and he was probably in his mid to late teens, probably more like mid-teens. And this favor of God fell on this boy that was in Bethlehem taking care of sheep. Jesse had eight sons. And can you know that it's amazing that yet the grace that came upon David and what God did in one person and how that one person responded to God in midst of many, many trials. When we have troubles in life, it's hard. When we have pain in life, it's hard. Whenever we have pain and pressure, it's hard. David suffered so many times under hardships and yet he had a tender heart towards God. It's important for all of us to know now, don't forget, 
David had a lot of shortcomings and he wasn't perfect. When he sinned, though, you're going to see how quick he was to ask for forgiveness, how he was genuine with his repentance. And this is a biggie. When he sinned, he never blamed somebody else. He took accountability for his own action. David, his heart, we'll talk more about this, his heart was a man who desired to be faithful, desired to be obedient, desired to live in worship towards God. And here's the biggie, to honor God in everything he did. Someone say everything. everything. And this changes everything in our life. So let's go to our portion of scripture today. Let's take a journey of the life of David, a man after God's own heart. Part one, God sees your heart. God sees the heart. Samuel 16, let's look at verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jess of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. I want you to understand, first of all, that Saul was chosen to be the first king of Israel. What the people of Israel did is they wanted to become like every other nation. So they asked the prophet Samuel, hey, listen, we want to be like everybody else. We want a king to lead for us. We want a king to go in battle for us. We want a king like everybody, every other nation. And they turned away from God. When they did that, God gave them Saul. And King Saul, well, he was... As the Bible says, he stood head and shoulders taller than everybody else. I mean, when King Saul walked in the building, he was tall. He was big. But when it comes to his faith, he wasn't big. If I could say he was a pygmy, we could probably go with that word. And we see those signs in his life. He may have been a giant among men, but he wasn't a giant before God. He chose when God was going to do a work in his life. He made choices, continual choices that were not going to honor or be obedient before God. And finally, God just said, that's it. And Saul was a jealous man. We'll get the chance to look at that. And he lived for the praise of people more than the praise of God. And that's very important for all of us. Do not focus on the praise of people. Always make sure you are praising God. Always direct praise back to God. Someone say amen. amen. He had numerous disobedience. And because of that, his choices, his attitude developed in a way where God said, that's it. I'm done. There's, we need a new king before all the people of Israel go so far astray. So if God finally tells Samuel, listen, I, I've already picked out, a, I, I picked out a person. I want you to go. Look what happens, though. I love this. Verse 2 and 3. But Samuel said, how can I go? Saul will hear about it and he will kill me. Now watch what God does. This is what God wants to talk with you, commune with you. He wants you to talk. God talks back. Look at your neighbor and say, God talks back. But the reason why, if you're not hearing God, maybe because you're not having enough conversations, because, see, you got to know when God speaks. And the only way you're going to know when God speaks is know his voice. Amen? When I call people up on the phone, it's not, it's not long before they know who exactly who I am. And I'm like, how do you know it's me? Now, everybody has caller ID, but this happened all my life. And they say, Pastor, there's something about your voice, your accent, that gives you away. So I'll call them and say, Hello? <laughs> And they still know who I am. <laughs> Why is that? Well, if you spend enough time with someone, you know their voice. And so that's the same thing with God. So here's this conversation taking place. He says, how can I go, Saul? will hear of it and kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Someone say, the one I indicate. This is important. Especially for those who are on our Wednesday night journey, escape the ordinary. You see, you and I need to understand that 
God is doing something, and I want you to notice how God's have how Samuel's having this nonchalant communication with God. Samuel, I want you to go and anoint Jess in Bethlehem, for I have one of his sons. But I don't want to go, Lord, because you see this conversation? Isn't it neat to get so close to God that you could have this conversation? And when God speaks, you actually know it's God's voice. And the only way you know God's voice is spending time in God. A lot of times people say, well, it's my conscience, I think. I don't think it's me. I think it's my conscience. Well, that's only because you don't spend enough time listening to his voice. There is no doubt when God speaks and you know his voice, you know. All I can tell you is you know that you know that you know. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? (laughs) Hey, she knows. So Samuel finally gets this instructions and Samuel's concerned for his safety and God gives him a simple way to do what he needs to do because you know you go to anoint another king when the king is living I don't know something happens to this king where he gets mad and anybody who's going to arise up against his authority he wants to kill him David was under the threat of Samuel his whole life because of jealousy And Samuel lost it all because of jealousy, insecurity. I want to bring something out here that's important. For those who are on our Wednesday night journey right now, escaping the ordinary, I want you to look here. It says this, invite Jesse and I will show you what to do. You will anoint for me the one I indicate. Isn't it interesting that God could have told him the guy's name, what son it was, And go there with a mission. Very clear. God didn't give him all the information. Let's say that again. God didn't give him all the information. God just said, go to Jesse. And then I'll let you know. I will communicate with you. The problem is, most people in the Christendom will not go and follow God because they're waiting for everything to be answered. You know, God, if you want me to do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. God don't always work on it like that. Sometimes he does, but sometimes he doesn't. But I will tell you this. You know that you know that you know. And it's not because someone says so. It's because God spoke. You know, a lot of times people go into the ministry. And they go into the ministry because somebody went up to them one day and said, Hey, you're going to have a great ministry. And they, someone speaks over them, have a ministry. But God never spoke to them, have a ministry. They're in ministry for five years. And then what happens? Oh, I've seen this so much. What happens after five years? They quit. Why do they quit? Because they don't get the calling. It's the calling that keeps you in place. It's the calling that keeps you steady. It's the calling to know that God spoke and God's have a plan. And when you know this, you can go with a, an assurity. And so God tells him what he needs to do. But he tells him without giving him all the information. So he has to walk with God by faith. He has to walk with God by obedience. And by doing before he hears what God wants him to do. And he walks on a journey. Here it goes. Ready, people? Step by step. Someone say step by step. step. We've been learning this incredible thing that in Scripture, how God's looking for people to do missions for him. But the problem why we stop is because we want God to answer everything. And the reality is we're not even doing what God's told us to do now. How can we do something greater if we can't do what God's already said to do now? So Samuel, being obedient, takes us to verse 4 and 5. Check this out. This is where it gets good. Get ready. Get your seatbelts on. Verse 4 and 5 says this. Samuel did what the Lord said. Someone shout out obedience. He didn't understand what mission was going on. He didn't understand what God was doing. He didn't know who he was going to. But he did what God asked him to do. Samuel did what the Lord said, even though he didn't understand what he was doing, even though it didn't make sense. He understood God was done with Saul and he had a heart for Saul. And God said, it's done. We have to move on. So he did what he had to do. And it says this, when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. This is powerful. The prophet comes in town. Look how they handle it. They're fearful. Because when the prophet of God says something, it meant something. Boy, we could learn a lot in our culture today. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. 
I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourself and come to the sacrifice with me. And then he consecrated Jess and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. I, I think it's amazing for you and I to grab hold of how they seen the prophet. How they seen the man or the woman of God all through scripture. We need to honor those who God is speaking through and standing up for what God wants to do. Truth. Samuel invites Jesse's sons. He consecrates them. This is where things get interesting. Look at verse 6 and 10. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and had a thought. Surely the Lord anointed stands here before the Lord but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jess called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jess then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel's said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jess had all seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Do you hear the mission? Do you feel the mission? Here's Samuel on a mission, and here's all his boys, and there's nobody. There's nobody. Samuel kind of has to figure this out. God didn't give him all the answers. God didn't chap him on the shoulder and say, Samuel, there's one more in the field that they haven't invited yet. No. Samuel has to ask the questions. Samuel has to really prog a little bit and try to understand what God is doing. I know I'm on a mission of God. I really understand this. But God hasn't given me all the details to his plan. I want you to get this part. This is powerful. It says in verse 1, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought. Someone say, and thought. How many times you have a thought, and it's not the right thought? How many times we have thoughts, but here it is, God heard his thought. Isn't that scary? But isn't that truthful? Here is Eliab, and here is the prophet of God who hears God, who walks with God. In a situation, he doesn't have all the answers either, yet. Because he's not sure who God's going to appoint. Because God just said this, I'll let you know. And God does that quite a bit. Abraham, leave everything with your son and go. And I'll let you know where to sacrifice them. I'll let you know. Abraham, leave your, fo your fathers and stuff and I'll let you know. Does anybody here like that type of instructions? Hey, get in your car, drive down that road and I'll let you know. Some of you wouldn't get out of the parking lot. I ain't moving until I know where I'm going. That affects you spiritually sometimes in God. Now, God, when God speaks, it's got to be God speaking. And God's speaking to Samuel, and he's on a mission, but he doesn't understand it. Problem is, the problem is, is that the only way you get to know God's heart and his voice is spending that time with him. It's not what others say. It's what God is saying. Amen. And so he has to start. Surely this is the one. This is it. Look at this guy. He has that square chin. He has those broad shoulders. He's strong. He looks kingly. Huh? God so swiftly, as soon as he has a thought, simply says, do not consider his appearance. Do not consider his height. I have rejected him. I want you to understand this word rejected in a little bit. Because then you have this, this Eliab, uh, I mean, um, Eliab who is, look like, it looks like he has all that in a bag of chips. His name means God of his father. God is father. And I want you to understand that even the prophet is working this out. So when you're in a problem with God, when you're in a situation and you don't have all the answers, but you know God has told you to share with someone. God has told you to do something. And you know you need to do. Sometimes you have to just walk by. Here it goes, really. You've got to walk by faith and let God. What God starts, God will complete. 
Be confident of this very thing, that he which begun a good work in you shall f- perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Right? God's always working in the plan that he starts. And Samuel saw his physical eyes, uh, with his physical eyes, a human understanding, his limited understanding, and he got it wrong. Because there was something about Eliab that disqualified him in his character, in who he was. And we're going to see what it is in a little bit. Because Eliab is seen very clearly in his character. Only God could see, because we're going to take you now back to Goliath. David and Goliath. And David comes on the scene and Goliath is given his, his spiel and challenging the armies of Israel. And David said, who, what will the king do for this man? Who defeats this king? And who's there? All three brothers in battle. And what does Eliab say to David? Oh, David, why are you here? You just come here to see a battle. I know the pride of your heart. And where are those sheep of yours? Those few sheep. See, the jealousy that always rised up in Eliab. <laughs> I'm going to give you a mic here. Um, I'm going to be preaching now. They just gave me a mic now. The evangelist comes out. Hallelujah! <laughs> I'm not joking. Something happens when I have a mic. It changes things. But this is what happens with Eliab. Eliab all of a sudden starts insulting David. But God says, a man after my own heart, I found someone who anointed. Eliab was right there that day when he got anointed. He wasn't anointed. But his little brother got anointed. And here David is starting to step up to the shoes in which God has created him to do and to be. And Eliab, the one that God said, no, no, he does not have the qualities or the qualification or the character or the heart to be king over the nation of Israel. Here's Eliab now looking down at his brother and accusing him of prideful heart. In just the opposite, Eliab is the one who has a prideful heart. Because who has not gone into battle? Who has listened to Goliath continually and sat right there and been scared? And here comes a young man. What will the king do for the one who slays this man, who insults the king, uh, the, the, the armies of Israel and our God? Oh, can you see the heart of the difference of the, of the vessel? Most people want to run from trouble. There are some people who run towards it in a good way. It's like when, when we look at cops or firefighters. There's people are trying to get out of a burning building. But firefighters are getting in to the burning building to save those in need. Here's David not seeing the problem and not saying, oh, I'm not going to do it, not me. <laughs> Look, I got somebody else. He's a little bit too big for me. You see the difference? God saw the heart before the Goliaths. We'll talk more about this in the future. But God put them through small tests before the big great test. So whatever you find yourself in today, may you understand that God wants to see you and to see what you're doing in the situation you're in. Abinadab means my father is noble, but he too, for some reason, God said, no, he doesn't have the goods. Shammah means astonishment, and yet God was not astonished with this man to be king of Israel. I want you to understand, these individuals no doubt had gifts. They no doubt had some good things about them. But God was looking for a certain vessel to do a certain work. And they needed to have a certain character. They need to do, uh, be a certain way. They need to be humble. They need to be teachable. They not need to be full of pride. And they need to be humbled. They need to be easily corrected. God was looking for a heart of an individual that he could strengthen and help and mold on the journey. In order for God to do a greater work. I don't know about you. 
But God sees in our hearts. He sees it all. When you go through a problem, have you ever had a problem? One problem maybe? How many have had at least one problem in your life? Raise your hand. Ha. Yeah. We have problems, but, but, but God sees it all. And I just want you to understand, when you go through the problem, it's not an if, it's really a when. When you go through your problem, God wants to see how you respond to the problem. Do you do it God's way? Do you do it your way? Do you think your way is higher than God's way? Because God sees it all. When you have a choice and you hold your tongue, when anger rises in you and you want your spirit wants to lose control because you don't want to obey when God says, keep it in. And you want to give him a piece of your mind because you feel like you're going to be so better when you give him a piece of your mind. And then afterwards you lose your mind. You gave too big a piece. But when you choose to hold your tongue and not let your anger control your, and your tongue and the words you speak, even about people you don't know, God still loved the Pharisees. God still loved those who were on the cross, even the day he died. We get so, so, so full of hatred sometimes. Uh, instead of, we don't fight people, there's a spiritual warfare. Never allow someone's view for you to disdain them or to pull down them. That's wrong in God. God so loved the world and that person's in the world. That means you need to love them. Look at your neighbor and say, that, that's hard. But that's truth. When you choose to hold your tongue and not let your anger control, but you submit to the ways of God, God sees that. When you choose to forgive others when they mistreat you. But you do what God's asked you to do. You forgive. And you learn to live. God sees that. When you sin before God and you mess up. You don't blame others. But you quickly repent for your own responsibilities. And not just say, the devil made me do it. Well, this happened because this person, no. But when you re just say, you know what? I have my own choice. And you just go before the Lord and you ask. And you quickly ask for forgiveness. God sees that. When you're faced with a great problem in difficult situations. And you feel between a rock and a hard place. But you put your faith in God. And you say, God, though I feel like I'm going to be slain, I shall trust you. That's when God shows up because God sees that. Because faith honors God. And God honors your faith. God sees it in the small things. We're always looking at the big things, but sometimes it's the small things that we do that make the difference in how God can use us. Proverbs 15, 3 says this. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. Someone say, he's watching. Because he knows everything. He sees it. Proverbs 5, 21 says, for the man's ways are full view of the Lord. He examines his path. God sees it. Hebrews 4:13 says nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Someone just say nothing. Mm -mm. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before his eyes of him whom we must all give an account. God sees it. So God saw David when he's all by himself protecting the sheep and if a man can go after a lion if a man can go after a bear because they got the sheep then he gonna be a good person to watch over my people the sheep of Israel you see how it works God's looking at our hearts God's not concerned in what we know and how long we've been in a building and how long we've been attached to an association God wants to know your heart is your heart for him that's why God said David was a man after my own heart. So what's important to God? What does God look at as being important? God looks at our inside, not our outside. We have a world today that's always working on the outside. How can we stay young forever? This cream and this cream. Do a tuck here and do a tuck here. Here a tuck, there a tuck, everywhere a tuck, tuck. 
We're always working on the outside. Failing, failing to work on the inside. And if you really, really want to change in the relationship with God, God wants to work on the inside. It's the heart. Because the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. God's looking for people of integrity and character that shines in the midst when no one sees his David being responsible for the sheep and willing to put his life to protect the sheep so that when he faces Papa, Papa's not going to get on him because of being irresponsible. It was David's job to protect those sheep, period. I want you to understand something. God's looking how we respond sometimes to the little things. God wants us, God's looking for our character, our traits, our integrity. God's looking for people who have an inner desire, an inner desire to be faithful. Remember, David wasn't holy. I mean, David wasn't perfect, should I say. And yet, he was holy. And yet, God did use him. And yet, God stood faithfully with him. And when you really look at the relationship, it's awesome. But David had the desire to truly be faithful, to truly be holy, to be honorable before God. It's the desire we have in our hearts to be connected, to be committed. You know, when things get tough, when things are hard, or you don't feel like it, you know, has anybody ever woke up one morning and said, I don't feel like it? And raise your hand. <laughs> Sometimes I don't feel like coming to church to preach. You know, God, will you pay? Oh, I'll give someone. I don't feel like it. There's other moments I feel like it. <laughs> I want you to understand something. That's the deep desire of wanting to please God, honor God. And if God gives you an opportunity to honor him, never take it lightly. Never forget the relationship that you are having with almighty God. He's actively looking at the conditions of our hearts. Look, look here. 11. Oh, wrong one. I'm sorry. I must have hit the button. 11. So he asked Jess. Because okay, he's confused. Uh, I thought God was going to pick one of these guys. Are these all your sons you have? They're still a youngest. Notice, he didn't even tell him his name. Just said the youngest. Surely, you don't want this guy. He's just too, he's too young. He's too ripe. He's, you know, he's not ripe, I should say. Jesse answered, but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and brought him in. He was ready with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise, anoint him. He's the one. So Samuel took his horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. Ooh. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Someone say in power. What did Samuel do after he committed his act of obedience? Uh, he went home. He did what he had to do. When you do what you're supposed to do, God will do the rest. If you do your best... God will do the rest. Let me point out a few things here quickly. He finally got his answer of who he had to anoint, and God said, right there, he's the one. Anoint him. Samuel had to go through all of the, the sons, not knowing who it was, and then have to ask the question, do you have any more sons? How many go up to someone, hey, do you have any more sons? Oh, sure, I have them in the closet. I mean, you know. But he didn't let it rest. Sometimes in the mission of God, and God give you a mission, you don't let it rest. You keep pursuing it because God's trying to do something. And sometimes in our life, when we don't understand it, remember, God's trying to do something. He's always trying to do something. When Samuel anointed David, he did it in front of all his brothers. And when God went after a man, he didn't go to the palaces, to the temples, places of influence or wealth and power. No, no. He found his person in the most unlikely places. I think of Mary, chosen of God, because she came from a poor family, a poor area, 
And yet she was a gem. She was a diamond in the rough. I tell you, Juan, come up here. Mm. You. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. He's like, he's not picking on me, is he? Okay, Juan. Today is uh, Chef Pastor. You know how to use these things? I guess so. <laughs> Uh, he knows how to use it quite really well. Um, these are the sons of Jess. There are eight here. And I don't know about you, but how many of you ever went to a bakery, saw something full of cream, and then you went up to it and, and you bought it because it looked so yum, yum, and you ate it and you're like, ugh, it looked good, tastes terrible. Or you go for fruit and you got a nice piece of fruit and, and then you open it up and it's terrible. Well, I'm going to tell you is that seven of these oranges are bad, bad to the bone. But one of them is good, right, eatable, yum. Now, Juan, you are going to play Juan. <laughs> I want you to try to pick one of those oranges. Pick the good one. The only one that's good. I don't know. I don't know. You picked that one? He picked that one. All right. We're going to leave this right now. I want you to uh, pick another one. Okay. Hold my mic. Let's see. Let's see if he picked good. <gasps> oh. <gasps> uh oh. All right, Juan. One more time. Let's see if you can do it. Oh, okay, Juan, one more time. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're on a game show. <laughs> All right, Juan, let's see. One more. one more. All right. And look at that. Oh. All right. Let's go. Oh, all right, man. 50, 50, 50, 50. <laughs> this illustration is going so well. You sure? I guess so. <laughs> you sure? All right. So this is his uh, sixth guess, eight, seventh guess. And on the seventh one. Thanks, Juan. The thing is, when we look at something from the outside, we can't tell what's on the inside. But God can. We need to recognize we can get it, we can get it wrong a lot because we're looking from the outside. God doesn't want us to look on the outside. He wants us to look on the inside. And so many of us, so many of us just seem to always look on the outside and not allow God to speak to us, to bring God into every situation, every circumstance of our life, even in the small things. Rise, anoint him, and he's the one. And when he was anointed, the power of God came upon him him to do great works because when God chooses you for a mission he will equip you he will empower you he will help you someone say I'm not alone you're not alone because God is on your side you need to realize that so many times so many times we always think we're alone we're not alone God is on our side look at this portion of scripture how many of you would have picked the apostle Paul for to do the work of God hmm Anybody? No. Isn't it interesting 
that we have David. Here he is in the, sh- in the wilderness taking care of sheep, being obedient, being loving of God, so dependent on God, dependent on God to save his life when he goes to the lions and bears. God grabs hold of him because he sees the heart. You got to catch this. You got to catch this. Here comes Saul. Here's a vessel now who's older, who's a religious man, who knows scripture, and yet now he's persecuting the church. Now he's causing death on the disciples. Now he's putting people in prison. He is raising havoc in the church. And God looks at his heart and says, he's going to be a chosen instrument for me. God sees both hearts Even though they were so different, God saw the heart. Look what it said here. This is Paul's words and the end of his life. I thank Christ Jesus. Oops. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me the strength that he has considered me, watch this, faithful, appointed me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and a violent man. I was shown, watch that word, mercy, because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me in abundance, along with the faith and love that is in Jesus Christ. Now watch this, 15. Here is a trustworthy saying and deserves all full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save a sinner of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would come and believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And everybody said, amen. Did you catch that? What a synopsis of the apostle Paul's life, understanding that God was looking at his heart even when he wasn't right. This is an incredible thing before you and I that we need to understand that God wants to do something in us, but can I encourage you? Can I really encourage you to just stop? And let me just say a few things. One, you can't worry about the past and your past decisions. What you have done in the past is just exactly what it is. It's those past lessons that make you who you are. Someone say amen. Amen. Paul the apostle became the vessel he could be because of his past. He understood grace more than anyone here because it was God's grace that was lavished upon him in such a way that he become the vessel God could use. So your past does not define you. Say that to yourself. My past does not define me. My future is written in my decisions of today. So what type of heart do you want to carry before God? What type of character do you want to live before God? What type of decisions will you make to know God greater? What type of things will you do to prevent yourself from doing things you know you shouldn't be doing? What addiction or what thing in your life that's grabbed hold of your heart? What attitude have you have in your heart? What unbelief? What negative thoughts that seem to make it part of your lifestyle because of what you've experienced. And the enemy wants to come in and steal, kill, and destroy. What is it? Because those things affect your heart. Everything that, every hurt and every pain that comes into our life, if we do not handle it right, if we do not handle it right, we will do wrong decisions and pave a path that God never intended. I don't know who we are today. But I do want you to understand that God has a plan. God has a plan for you. And just as he did with David and just as he did with Saul, both of them at different points of life. But when Paul had an encounter with God, watch this now, everything changed. 
You see, so often people live life and they go through hurt. They go through hardships. They go through situations. And instead of them allowing God to make it better, stronger, every time I go through something that hurts, every time my heart cr is crushed, every time I feel like an, a, a man on an island far from uh, uh, civilization, all of these things and moments and seasons of life that are difficult to experience, how we handle them will to dictate what happens in our life. And if we handle them according to the way God has asked us to, and we bring God into the situation, and we make God our first love, watch this, everything will change. Because we're not living by the decisions of the past. We're living by the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, which is today and which is tomorrow. And when we know God has our today and we can live by faith, we know God has our future. Can someone say praise the Lord in the house of God? Can you stand to your feet? Those by watching online, maybe you have never made Jesus your savior. Maybe you have never asked God to come into your life. I want you to right now, it's very simple. Those here, maybe you've never committed your whole life to the Lord. Maybe you've got a little bit of religion in you, but you don't have a real relationship with God. And if you died right now, if you died right now, you're not sure heaven be home. You would want heaven to be your home, but you're not sure. And it doesn't make a difference that you've been in the house of the Lord for a long, long time. It doesn't matter. But you just have to right now, in your heart, in your heart, Maybe there's some attitudes that you have. Maybe there's some lack of faith going on. Maybe there's some things that you know right now that the Spirit of God has brought to your remembrance. And they're controlling you. Maybe the things of the past. Maybe fear. Maybe uncertainty. You don't have to worry about that because your God holds your tomorrow. Someone say, my God holds my tomorrows. He holds my todays. He promised to be with me. Never leave me. And right now, those online, those here, just say right now, if you have not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, just say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I've done it my own way. I've done it my own way. I don't given you any part of my life or I've been more about religion than I've been about relationship. Right now, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you forgive me, that you come into my heart. I surrender my heart to you. And ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people said, now maybe you're here today and you look at having the heart that God, a, God, a heart after God's own heart. How many would say, you know what? I have a hunger to have a heart like that. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Yes. 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 You know what's amazing? Is when a person is hungry, they don't care about anything. I, I like to put it this way before I close. I'm going to give you a challenge. In, in the church, I often see this. People act like they're bold in God, but you ask them a question and they can't even respond to it. If I say if you love Jesus, you do, you don't. You, you respond to it. If you can't respond here, you're not going to respond out there. And the reality is I want to challenge you on this is God has a work for you to do he has a work i don't care what age you are stop giving your age is a is a problem stop giving your situation you're in as a problem listen we all have them and god's over them someone say amen, amen. we all have situations everybody's at a different situation but we still have the same god over the situation someone say praise the lord so once again raise your hand if you want to have a heart like God's heart, like David. Because that's what God wants from us. Father, you see the hands. Father, you see the hands that are truly connected to the heart. And I pray right now that you would do a work in each one here. That, Lord, they say, God, I want to be known as a person that has a heart after you. I am not going to be bashful. I'm not going to be ashamed. I'm hungry to have a heart for you, God. I'm thirsty to have a heart for you, God. I desire, Lord, to have a heart for you, God. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I ask those things that are hindering me, preventing me, stopping my thoughts, things I'm doing, 
things that people have said, negative things that people have said of my past. I right now no longer make them, they have no power anymore. We break the chains right now in Jesus' name. I pray a fresh way of thinking. I pray right now boldness in the Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, right now that you just baptize individuals in the Holy Spirit. I pray a hunger and a thirst for you, God, as they desire you. God, we just praise you. We just ask, do a work in each heart. And we ask this in the majestic name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people with a loud voice said, Amen. Give them some praise in the house of the Lord. Let's go out these walls and understand that God just wants us to be a real deal. And God wants you. He sees you right where you are. And right now, just have always have a quick account because the best is yet to come. Get hungry. Be hungry. Be hungry, hippo. Want more of God. More of His Spirit. More of God. So don't live on yesterday's bread. How many know there's fresh bread to come? How many know there's something more fresh? You ever been next to an oven that just cooked fresh bread? Oh, oh, it smells so good. You just can't wait to take it out. How hungry are you for the fresh blood of heaven so that God can start to do something? Well, we thank you for joining us today. Let's continue to believe that God is going to do a work in all of our lives and in his church, despite our current circumstances. If you would like to support the ministry of Salem First Assembly, you can do so by mailing to 430 Route 45, Salem, New Jersey, 08079 or by visiting our website at salemfirstag.org Please join us for service next Sunday at 10.30 a.m. or you can watch service every Sunday afternoon on Facebook at Salem First Assembly or YouTube at Salem First AG. You can also listen to the message every Tuesday on Podbean. Have a blessed rest of your day. Let's remember to be a blessing and that life is living in faith every day.